On the 30th of January, 1649, Charles I's head was severed from his body. This anointed king was killed in the full light of day with the backing of Parliament. This brutal act of regicide comes after seven years of war that divides towns, friends and even families. There is nothing civil about civil war. They have seen so much suffering and death and destruction. They've just had enough. I'm historian Lisa Hilton, and over three episodes I'll trace, day by day, hour by hour, the five weeks that led to one of the most seismic moments in our constitutional history, the trial and death of Charles I, a king anointed by God. No king in England had ever been put on trial for any charge, let alone treason. It was unprecedented. How did the nation affect this radical step, the reverberations of which are still felt, even to this day? What they did do changed English law and politics forever. Hidden within these weeks are the chance events, secret manipulations and revolutionary actions which led to this ultimate decision. How did a country kill its king? It's Christmas Day in the year of our Lord, 1648. King Charles I is spending Christmas imprisoned in Windsor Castle. He has lost the civil war after being captured 18 months earlier by his enemies in Parliament. Charles eats alone, reading the Christmas service from his Book of Common Prayer. His family are in exile, his beloved wife is in Paris, his eldest children are scattered across Europe. The youngest are in parliamentarian custody in England. There's no family Christmas for Charles this year. And here in Windsor, Charles isn't the only one having a quiet Christmas. The Puritans are in power and they've done their best to ban what they consider to be a pagan festival. There are laws making the exchanging of gifts the wearing of fine clothes, feasting and dancing, punishable with a hefty five shilling fine. It's not exactly festive. So in London, Christmas Day 1648 is like any other working day. Markets are open, working men and women go about their business, and in Parliament there's no recess. And today they're urgently debating the future of the country. That all depends on what to do with the king. In theory, the king and parliament should work together, but the events of the past seven years have put an end to that. MPs now speak openly of Charles as a man of blood, and they demand that he be made to answer for the horrible violence of the Civil War. Amongst the MPs sitting that day is Oliver Cromwell. Cromwell comes from a relatively humble background. He's been an MP since 1628, but his early life and career were unremarkable. Cromwell's not someone who stands on ceremony. He's not impressed by any of that. He famously dresses very shabbily, he has ill-fitting clothes, his hair could do with a comb, he's once seen with blood specks on his collar, you know, he's cut himself shaving. And this is sort of part of his shtick, really. He famously once said that he would rather have a plain, russet-coated captain who knows what he fights for and loves what he knows than that which you call a gentleman and is nothing else. Cromwell had some sort of nervous breakdown in his 20s, which he later referred to as his melancholia, and from that point on was a devout Puritan. We know that Cromwell had a religious conversion in the 16, late 1630s, 
which turned him into the kind of Puritan he was. It's always a dialogue between him and God. But Cromwell is up against a king who is absolutely convinced of his divine right to rule. Charles believes that he's answerable to God, not Parliament. But the reality is that he's a prisoner of Parliament. And for the last three years, they've tried to get Charles to agree to limit his power. Parliament keep negotiating. They keep going back to Charles, back to Charles, saying, you know, come to terms with us, come to terms with us. Um, and these negotiations are going on and on and on. Cromwell, by nature, is a negotiator. He wants to have a settlement between the army and Parliament and the King. What he wants is for the King to come to some kind of constitutional settlement to something that's like a modern constitutional monarchy. So far, Charles has refused to compromise. He was not prepared to give up. He was not prepared to deny his God. He would not agree to that, and that was demanded of him. For him, it's very simple, you know, his will is God's will, and he is accountable to no earthly authority. As night falls on Christmas Day, in a last-ditch attempt, Cromwell sends one of his parliamentarian supporters, the Earl of Denby, to reason with the king. The story goes that Charles refuses to see Denby and turns him away without even hearing the offer from Parliament. It seems inconceivable that this deadlock is ever going to be broken. The time to negotiate has come to an end. Tomorrow, Cromwell and Parliament will have to think of a new way to resolve this stalemate. Charles wakes up on the 26th of December. Once he would have spent the day celebrating the Feast of St. Stephen, and his servants would have enjoyed their Christmas boxes. Instead, today, he follows his usual routine as a prisoner at Windsor. So Charles in Windsor, it's not great for him. He's used to space, he's used to majesty, he's used to his own servants. Now he's got army guards, and it's quite a strict confinement. You know, he's got a guard on every door. He doesn't have his family, he doesn't have his friends. So Charles was becoming increasingly confined. When he'd been imprisoned at Carisbrook Castle, uh, he had at first been allowed to walk around all the grounds. A very physical man, he liked riding, um, playing bowls, but he'd become increasingly confined. Carisbrook had even been uh, allowed to see a woman who was reputed to be his mistress, uh, and he sort of wrote her rather racy letters saying that he wanted to meet her in his private closet and give her a good swiving. Anyway, there was definitely no swiving to be had at uh, Windsor that Christmas. Parliament does allow Charles to have a servant of their choosing, a gentleman of the bedchamber called Thomas Herbert. Herbert later writes an account of his time with the king. In his memoir, Thomas Herbert describes how Charles spends his days. Mornings are devoted to prayer, and in the afternoons he takes exercise, walking here on the north terrace at Windsor. According to Herbert, Charles likes this spot best because it has a very delightful view of the River Thames with many pleasant hills and valleys, villages and fine houses far and near. Charles has no way of knowing how long this prison life will go on. He doesn't know that by the 26th of December, Parliament has had enough of his refusal to compromise. Now, whispers in Whitehall begin that the King might be put on trial for treason. Can a King commit treason? Pretty difficult, you know, when you've got the 1351 Treason Act, which makes it a crime punishable by death to compass or imagine. 
the deposing of a king or to fight for his enemies. So the law of treason is really uh, fashioned to protect the king, not put him on trial. So how, by Christmas 1648, had this shocking proposition come about? Seven years of civil war has left the country devastated. Battles, skirmishes and sieges took place the length and breadth of the country. Nowhere and no one was left untouched. You know, for the vast majority of the people, they've just had enough, you know? They just want to get on with it. They want to move on with their lives. You know, there is nothing civil about civil war. And they have seen so much suffering and death and destruction. And I just think they just need closure. They need to move on. And by Christmas 1648, the winners of the war believe that the blame for all this bloodshed lies at the king's feet. The troops were demanding justice. A great cry of justice on this man of blood. And they had good reason, because the war that the king started back in 1642 had killed one in ten Englishmen. More! comparatively, than died in the First World War. One in ten Englishmen were lying dead in the muddy fields of Marston Moor and Naseby and so on. And many more were injured and were permanently injured. The towns were full of beggars who were trailing a lost limb from the fight with the king. I've come to Leicester, a city that suffered horribly under siege by royalist forces, to look at a collection of petitions from local residents. The characteristic action of the civil wars was not a set-piece battle, it was an mm -hmm. attack on a fortified strong point. And if uh, an army broke into a town and terms of surrender hadn't been made, then they could unleash a, a wave of violence, a wave of retributory violence that would have led to murder, um, robbery, um, cutting, maiming, and, and rape. An appalling list of consequences for someone who is effectively an innocent bystander. These documents, over 300 years old, are compensation petitions. Their claims for damages trace a litany of human tragedy. What are we looking at right here? Well, here's an example of one of those petitions from William Sumner, a tailor in the town of Leicester, to the mayor and alderman of the town, complaining that when the king's forces sacked Leicester in 1645, they'd killed his son, and that his house had been pulled down, and that, and with the fright whereof, your petitioner's wife hath been distracted ever since. It's such a vivid connection reading about William's wife being distracted, and it's, she suddenly becomes a, a real person. Is that something you've experienced going through these archives? Well, yes, we've found many similar stories uh, to this one of people overcome by grief. How many of these petitions are in existence? We estimate um, there are about 4,000 petitions of this ilk in the county record offices in England and Wales plus a huge amount more in the National Archives as well. Being in the archive gave an immense jolt of empathy, suddenly seeing the casualties of the Civil War not as numbers or statistics, but as real people, people who lost their families, their livelihoods, their homes. Suddenly they become immensely and poignantly human. <laughs> 